Hi, everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. Always a pleasure coming your way as we continue with our discussion towards the ICA April 2022 examination. And we are starting with our IFRS masterclass going into it straight up. If you're writing corporate reporting, financial reporting, or you are planning of writing corporate reporting or financial reporting, these are papers that are going to be very critical, very basic. And so the standard uh, IFRS 15 Revenue from contract with customers is one of the basic standards that we need to understand about revenue recognition for us to be able to position ourselves to pass the examination. Not only that, if you are somebody going to be writing advanced audit and assurance, then as part of auditing of financial statements, one of the key issues is going to be uh, auditing of revenue. And if you are looking at how we audit revenue, we must look at how uh, the entity has recognized the revenue in the financial statement, whether they may, it meets the recognition criteria for IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers using the principle of cutoff and completeness and all that at the end of the day. And that is what we want to go into today as we get ourselves excited for the examination. So IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. If there are any questions, put it in the chat for me. I'm going to be reading all of your comments for you. If there are any questions you have, put it in the chat as we go straight up into the discussion for IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. I'm reading all of your comments coming in here and I'm going to be uh, looking at them straight up in that uh, regard as we continue with our discussion. Sylvia Mercy said, hi, sir. Hello, Sylvia Mercy. I hope that you're doing well. Thanks for joining us on the live stream give us a thumbs up on the video when you join and then share the video let us reach as many students as possible as well on the live stream so let me share my screen let's get excited and then let's go straight up into our discussion so let's see i'm bringing up my screen momentarily All right, coming up. Okay, so my screen is up now. We wanna go uh, straight up into our discussion and look at IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers revenue from contracts with customers. Now, this accounting standard is actually a replacement for two key accounting standards uh, that were previously known as IAS 18, revenue, and then uh, IAS 11, construction contracts. So actually our discussion in IFRS 5 revenue from contract with customers is gonna be premising or is gonna be premised on these two things with some specific issues that we need to take note of. Now, somebody who asked, I mean, why the need for uh, IFRS 15, why was it introduced by the International Accounting Standard Board to be able to re uh, recognize revenue? Why IAS 18, what was wrong with it? You see, the idea about revenue recognition is that under IAS 18, revenue from contract with customers, entities recognize revenue when a transaction takes place. I mean, using the accrual concept. So immediately uh, an order is received, then the entity recognizes the revenue. Now, this principle of I and the IAS 18 lead, led to overstating of profit in one accounting period and understating of profit in another accounting period. Because for instance, when it comes to the year end, the entity may receive orders. Okay, when the entity receives orders as part of the accrual concept, immediately an order is received, then that order must be included as part of our what, revenue generally at the end of the day. Now, have we dispatched the thing? No, because the entity would say, oh, we've received the orders, we are preparing the dispatch, but they've not dispatched it. Or the entity has signed a contract, 
Now, by virtue of the fact that they have signed a contract and received some money, then they will say, hey, let's recognize revenue. So you realize that in one accounting year, revenue is going to be overstated, which means profit is going to be overstated. But then in the subsequent accounting year where they now actually do the work, they now actually execute the contracts, they end up earning or incurring less, more cost and no revenue in respect of that particular activity. So this is one of the issues that came up with IAS 18 that has to be looked at and that has to be corrected at the end of the day. So the premise of IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers is that we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. So the takeaway I want you to have straight up is that under IFRS 15, Revenue is recognized. Revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. When a performance obligation is satisfied. Revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. What does that mean? It simply means before we recognize revenue, we need to ask ourselves, have we done the job? Has there been transfer of control in the goods, in the assets, in the question? That is a key question we ask ourselves when we are dealing with the issue about revenue recognition at this level, have we transfer control? In other words, any risks and rewards associated with the uh, goods in question and the activity in question, has it been transferred to the customer? So we can only recognize revenue when we have transfer control. So before we get excited, before we begin to look at the various key issues, this is the takeaway I want you to have. Now, when it comes to IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers, we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is what? Satisfied. In other words, we recognize revenue when there has been transfer of control, then we can recognize revenue in relation to that particular goods or services that we are dealing with. So that is off the hook, what you need to understand when we deal with IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. Now, the, the premise or the primary issue that I just spoke about is actually the fifth leg. In other words, IFRS 15 recognizes a five-step framework for revenue recognition. So there are a five-step framework that we must follow to recognize revenue when it comes to IFRS 15. So these five-step framework, it's critical. We must satisfy all of the uh, steps. We must follow the steps one after the other before we can say we have recognized revenue for the period under review. So there are five-step framework we need to go into. I see some of you guys joining, you are welcome. Comment in the comment section, any questions you have for me. Joshua Boachi Yadam said, good afternoon, sir. Hope you are doing good today. Yes, uh, Yadam, I'm good, and I hope you are well also. And then Dave Bruce said, listening attentively. All right, Dave, welcome to the live stream. Give us a thumbs up on the video, you guys. When you join, it helps us a lot to get more engagement on the video. Now, so before we get excited into all of these, remember, Remember what I mentioned in the introduction here, that there are two key standards that we're going to be looking out for, IAS uh, 18, this is a replacement in the standard, and then IAS 11, construction contract as well in that case. So how do we uh, look at all these as an organization to start with? Now, another distinction, even before I get again excited about going into IFRS 15 is that, for instance, there are certain marketing expenses or certain costs that an entity incurs, which under IAS 18 will be recognized as part of expenses, but then in IFRS 15 will be recognized separately. And we'll get into that in a moment. So before we get excited, we want to define a number of 
terminologies real quick as we get into this and then look at the things that we need to consider. So let's define a number of terminologies real quick as we go into it. Timothy Ahas, I see you. I hope you're doing well. Good evening. Adolf, Adolfos Tuas, Chia, what, forever. Forgive me if I don't mention your name well, Chia. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Adolfos. Thanks for joining us. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video. It helps us a lot to get more engagement and YouTube will push it so we can reach a lot of students across the continent and across the globe. So let's go into it. Some key definitions. Number one is what is a contract? Remember we said this is IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. Revenue from contract with customers. So uh, what do we deal with here? A contract is an agreement between two or more parties that create enforceable rights and obligations. That create enforceable rights and obligation that creates enforceable rights and obligations. Then, so that is a contract. Now, if you like, we are just introducing ourselves. But one key thing you need to understand here it's performance obligation. Remember, I told you about performance obligation a moment ago. So, what is performance obligation? Performance obligation is simply a promise, a promise uh, in a contract with a customer to transfer to the customer either. Good. So performance obligation is a promise. So let, let me give you an example. Let, let's say that, uh, uh, let's say Sylvia comes to me and Sylvia says, hey, Shira, I want you to teach me, all right, uh, for my exams. And I said, all right, Sylvia, my private tuition is 2,500 Ghana cities uh, per paper. That's my private tuition. Now, as part of this package, what do you get? Okay. As part of this package, you get your private tuition uh, with me, live private tuition. Uh, with me, you get access to some ebooks, you get access to some question kits, you get access to uh, getting the videos on our portal. Okay, so this is my promise to you. Okay, what I'm going to do under this contract, that is the performance obligation. So the performance obligation is what the entity will or promises to give under the contract to the customer. I, I hope you're getting the idea. So all these are my promise. What I'm going to give to Messi, should she pay me 2,500 Ghana cities to have to teach her? So that is performance obligation, performance obligation. A promise in a contract with a customer to transfer to the customer A, a good or service or B, a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of fair to the customer. So that is performance obligation. So this is going to be very critical for you to understand IFRS 15 uh, in a moment. So you make sure that you understand that very well. Then another key thing we need to understand is transaction price transaction price. So what is transaction price? We say that this refers to the amount of consideration to which an entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring promised goods to a customer, excluding amounts collected on behalf of third parties, excluding amounts collected on behalf of third parties. So what does that mean? In my illustration here, Ahmed mentioned that Mercy is going to give me 2,500 Ghana cities. This amount Mercy is going to give to me, 2,500, is what we refer to as what? The transaction price. Now, these two words, performance obligation and transaction price, are going to be very critical as we get into the discussion in a moment, and you want to make sure you understand this uh, pretty well as we go ahead in our discussion. Okay, Sylvia so said, which book do you uh, refer? So, uh, I don't, and, uh, if, I'm re if I refer to any book, it will be uh, an ACCA book, ACCA F7 book, or my book on uh, financial reporting. We re released a notebook on financial reporting. So questions and discussions will primarily come 
from that particular book and uh, you're going to see it on my screen as we continue with our discussion one do look i said hello hope you are fine yes i'm doing well please how much is 390 ghana cities in naira uh you could just google that and you'll be able to uh i think get that on google 390 ghana cities in naira when you google that you'll be able to uh get it I think uh, this is not a current exchange rate. So you can Google that 26,079 uh, Naira. So you could uh, check that out and Google that and see for yourself. Uh, one do look at. Enisu said, hello, sir. Hi, Enisu. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. Uh, please, what role does purchase order plays in revenue recognition. That is Elijah Quay. Uh, purchase order plays in revenue recognition. Purchase order doesn't play any role when it comes to revenue recognition. Because like I said a moment ago, under IFRS 15, we will recognize revenue when we have done the job. Okay, when we have done the job, executed the contract that is when we recognize revenue so when we receive a purchase order that is not anything so we cannot recognize any revenue <laughs> now if the customer makes any amount okay so income prepaid we receive uh, any amount in advance of how much we are supposed to receive that is a deferred income it's a liability so it has to be recognized as a deferred income because it is a liability on the face of the statement of financial position. Then as and when we satisfy the performance obligation, we're going to be recognizing that. So purchases order plays no role when it comes to revenue recognition, because we only recognize the revenue when we have actually sent the goods to the person and the person has acknowledged receipt of the goods and the person is satisfied with the goods. So Elijah, Akwe, uh, I hope that makes sense for you. Eric Boabin said, hello, say hi, Eric. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the live stream today and thanks for joining us on the live stream. So these two words are gonna be critical as we jump into them in a moment, as we jump into them in a moment. Now, so remember, one of the key issues that came a moment ago is the issue about transfer. So I mentioned that when it comes to revenue recognition, we must recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. So the key thing about performance obligation being satisfied is when there is transfer of control in that particular goods in question. Now, when we say transfer in goods in the question, what do we actually mean? What do we mean? So there are certain indicators of transfer of control. Number one, the entity has a present right to pay for the assets. Meaning for instance, uh, we've given the goods to the customer and then the customer has it. So now uh, they have to pay us. Two, the customer has legal title to the assets. So now, it is not us owning the asset again. The customer owns the asset. It means we have transferred the asset to the person. The entity has transferred physical possession of the inventory. So now the inventory is no longer with us. It is with the customer. Then certainly we can satisfy inventory. Then risks and rewards of ownership have been transferred to the customer. So sometimes, for instance, a customer can place order with us, but the customer will say, hey, uh, just keep the goods in your warehouse. I'm going to bear any cost. I'm going to pay for any insurance, but I just want you to keep it in your warehouse. Later on, I'll come for it. Now, as far as uh, any risk and reward has been transferred to the customer, and now the customer is the one liable to make the payment, uh, liable for the goods, we have to recognize revenue. So what are we saying so far in a nutshell? What we are saying so far in a nutshell is this, that number one, when it comes to revenue recognition, under IFRS 15, we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. Number two, 
a performance obligation is satisfied when there is transfer of control in the goods, works, or services in question. In the goods, works, or services in the question at the end of the day. Then to determine whether there is transfer of control, it could be physical possession of the goods, it could be transfer of risks or rewards, it could be uh, title documents or the customer's name, it's uh, the customer is bearing the title document to the goods, then we can uh, look at the goods at the end of the day in that regard. So that is the issue about this. So now the big question, what is the uh, issue about the five-step framework for revenue recognition? What is the issue about the five-step framework for revenue recognition? So let's go into the five-step framework for revenue recognition. And this is where the whole discussion is going to be centered around. Now, theory of a written aspect, financial reporting in question five, the examiner can ask you this. Remember, in financial reporting, there will be a five mark question on accounting standard theory, written aspect. And this is an area the examiner can ask you. Corporate reporting students also, the same thing, the examiner can ask you this, and you need to be on the lookout to understand how the treatments are generally when it comes to dealing with this particular one. So let's look at a five step framework for revenue recognition. Step number one is to identify the contract with customer. Number one, we need to identify the contract with a customer. Now, so when we say we are identifying a contract with customer, what exactly do we, that is the first aspect. That is the first aspect we need to identify is there a contract with the customer is there a contract with the customer now to determine whether there is a contract with a customer there are a number of conditions that must be met what does that mean number one both parties are committed to carrying it out that's the first thing both parties are committed to carrying it out so like the example i gave a moment ago that for instance mary comes and say insurer i want you to teach me for whatever uh let's say uh accounting so uh I, i'm charging you two thousand five hundred okay then mary said she's gonna pay then i said all right if that is okay i'm also willing to teach you it means that insurer is committed to uh carry out the work then mary is also committed to what make the payment that is the first thing we need to understand about looking at contracts number two each party's right to be transferred can be identified each party's right to be transferred can be identified now so what is being transferred at the end of The day here when it comes to my illustration example i gave a moment ago i'm going to teach mary so she's going to get access to private tuition uh, with me once a week for three months she's going to get access to both and some question skits she's going to get access to the lecture videos right she's going to get access to the lecture videos so these are the things i promised to give her so this is my transfer to her. Then she is also going to give me what? 2,500 Ghana cities for the fee. So that is the second thing. So not only are we committed to carrying it out, everybody's right has been identified. Three, the payment terms can be identified. The payment terms. So when are you giving me the money? Very, very important. The contract has a commercial substance. It's not free. Now, if it is free, then there is no revenue. If it is free, then there is no need for us to recognize anything at the end of the day. So there must be some commercial substance at the end of the day. But most importantly, it should be, it is probable the entity will collect the consideration. It is probable the entity will collect the consideration. Why is that important? Because for instance, if I'm charging Mary 2,500 for a private tuition, 
And for some reason, Mary cannot pay the 2,500 Ghana cities for a private tuition, then I better not even recognize anything. So it means that if I'm going to recognize that 2,500, then I better make provision for bad debts right from the beginning of uh, the contracts that I'm not going to be receiving all the money, but it should be probable that we will receive the consideration. That is the first thing. Identify the contract with the customer. Both parties are committed. Each party's right is identified. Payment terms have been agreed on. The contract has a commercial value, and it is probable that we will actually receive our money. That is the first thing. Is there a contract? Yes. Yes. Some questions are coming up, and I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video. Uh, it helps us a lot to reach many people because YouTube can push the video for us to reach others. So give us a thumbs up on the video if you are getting some value. Share the video also. Let us reach many students coming in. Elijah said, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Vincent Boster said, good evening, Inshira. I hope you're doing well. Yes, I'm flourishing. Thanks for asking. And I hope you're also doing well, Vincent. Um, watching live from Arusha, Tanzania. OK, thanks for joining us, uh, Vincent. Uh, Seth Ose Nyako said, watching you attentively. OK, Seth, thanks for joining us on the live stream today. Uh, Philip Minta said, the purchase order may satisfy the first step of, OK. So that is the first thing. Identify, sorry, the contract. Second. Immediately we identify the contract that there is a contract, then the second question we need to ask ourselves is the performance obligation. What is the entity going to give to the customer in return for the consideration that is going to be received? So if I go back to my illustration here, now I want you to stay with me carefully. If I go back to my illustration here, you realize that I am going to teach Mary. I'm going to give Mary some books. And I'm going to give Mary some lecture videos. These are the performance obligation. What I am going to be doing on the contract. So the first thing is, is there a contract? Are we committed? Are we going to get the money? The second thing is, what are we to do under this contract? So that is the performance obligation. What are we to do under this contract? That is the performance obligation. What are we to do under the contract? Once we identify the a performance obligation, the, the next thing is to look at the transaction price, the transaction price. But even before I come to the uh, transaction price, let's look at uh, an illustration quickly here uh, for us to look at how we can get the performance obligation. So let's look at an illustrative question here so that you find out like from this question, how we can determine the performance obligation for this scenario. Now, the requirement here is that explain whether the goods or services provided by Logistici, Logisticity Co. are distinct in accordance with IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. So let's see. Office Solutions Co., a limited company, has developed a communication software package called Comsoft. Office Solutions Co. has entered into a contract, okay, has entered into a contract with Logistics City uh, Co. to supply the following. So our company is Office solutions okay and they have developed a software package called comsoft and they have entered into contract with another company logis tct co at the end of the day so let's look at the things they are going to do one they will give them license to use the software two installation service this may require an upgrade to the computer operating system, but the software package does not need to be customized. So there is installation service. 
Three, there is technical support for three years. And then four, three years of update for Comsoft. Office Solutions Co. is not the only company able to install and install Comsoft. And the technical support can also be provided by other company. The software can function without the updates and technical support. So I want you to pay attention very carefully here because we need to look at what is uh, Office Solution doing under this contract. What would they do? That is a performance obligation. What would they do under the contract? Now, if you listen to the language very well, we'll give them license. That is a performance obligation on its own. It's distinct. We give you license to use the software. We give you the software. Now, pay attention carefully well, because the examiner said, Office Solution is not the only company able to install Comsoft. Okay, meaning the installation service is also another thing that can be done. So we can give you the license, then you can go and engage another company to install the license for the software for you. We don't have problem. It means the installation is also another performance obligation. Then the examiner said, again, Office, Co Office Solution Co is not the only company to provide technical support. Okay, which means the technical support is also a distinct activity, a distinct obligation for the period under review, then three, the, or number four, three years of updates for Comsoft. And then we are told that the software can function with the updates and, sorry, without the updates and technical support. So it tells you that, it tells you that from the scenario, you realize that in conclusion, the goods and services The goods and services are distant and amounts and amounts to four performance obligation in the contract. under IFRS 15. I hope you are getting the picture so far. So that is the issue that we must understand here when it comes to this particular question. That is the issue we must understand here when it comes to this particular question, that each of these activities are distinct. They are separate. They are on their own. For that reason, each of them is a performance obligation that we need to undertake. I hope you get the idea. Any questions for me, you put it in the chat and I'm gonna be answering all your questions for you as we go into this discussion right here. So once we determine what we need to do, the next thing we need to ask ourselves and find out is the issue about transaction price. Remember I told you earlier that the transaction price is the amount we're gonna be receiving. So it refers to the amount to which the entity expects to be entitled. The amounts to which the entity is expect to be entitled. So from an illustration here, how much am I entitled to from Mary? I am entitled to 2,500 Ghana cities from Mary. So that becomes my uh, performance, oblig sorry, that becomes the transaction price. I'll be getting it. That becomes the transaction price uh, for the period under review. How much I am entitled to, how much we are entitled to when it comes to dealing with the question for this period under review. Now, let's look at a question where there is transaction price separately so that we find out what we can look for in this particular scenario. And I want you to uh, stay with me pretty well uh, on this one as we go into it and see 
how exactly you can look at it. So look at this illustration here. Look at this illustration here so that you see how we are going to look at the transaction price. Now, immediately we find the transaction price. Let me go to the fourth one, then I'll come to this. Uh, four is to allocate transaction price to performance obligations. Now, this is the most important aspect of the whole discussion. We allocate the performance obligation to the transaction price using standalone prices, standalone selling prices of a contract, using standalone selling prices of the contract, using standalone selling prices of the contract. Now, let me explain this to you. Let's go back to my illustration with Mary. Now, I want you to pay attention to me carefully here because I'm going to just open it up to you. Then you get an understanding very simply. So this is Mary. She's giving me $2,500, Ghana cities. Um, so I'm teaching her. So there is private tuition here. Stay with me carefully. Private tuition. Um, there are some books she gets. Then uh, she also gets access to the videos. Okay, so these are the things I'm going to do. Now, step three, step four is saying that we should allocate. Once there is more than one performance obligation, then we have to allocate it. We have to allocate our transaction price to the performance obligation using their standalone price, selling price. Now, standalone selling price simply means, stay with me carefully, standalone selling price simply means the price that I we will charge if the individual or the separate activities under the contract is being sold, how much are we gonna charge? How much are we gonna charge? So, so let me explain this to you real quick. So standalone price is gonna be here. Standalone price. Now, let me bring this guy a little bit down. Don't worry. Uh, we can put the name up here. So standalone price simply means, assuming I'm teaching a loan, I'm providing private tuition alone without books, without a video. How much would I have charged? Okay, so probably I would have charged 2,000 Ghana cities. Okay, if I'm giving the books alone, I'm not teaching, I'm not giving you videos, how much would I have charged? Probably I'll charge you 450 Ghana cities. Okay, if I'm giving you the lecture videos alone, no books, no private tuition, how much would I have charged? Probably I'll charge you 1,200 Ghana cities. Are you following carefully? This is step four we are dealing with. Like I said, this is the most important aspect of the discussion. You identify the contract, you state, you uh, determine the transaction price. Uh, sorry, you identify the performance obligation, you determine the transaction price, then you allocate. So if you look at it, you realize that the three performance obligation that I'm going to be doing, giving out to Mary, will actually cost us how much? 2000 1200 and then 450 will actually cost us $3,650 or Ghana cities. I don't know where. Maybe let's just say stay with dollars because it's like um, I'm always, let's just stay with dollars here and just finish with it. Okay. So $3,650. Now, I want you to stay with me carefully. So the value of the three things I'm going to give to Mary is actually 3650 But how much is she paying? She's paying only 2500 This is the transaction price, TP. So what do we do? We need to allocate the transaction price to performance obligation. How do we do that allocation? We do that allocation using the standalone prices. So this revenue will be allocated to the various activities in question. Are you following me carefully? So let's look at how the allocation is done. So private tuition, it's gonna be $2,000 over the total value of the uh, performance obligation 3650 times the transaction price we are receiving 2500. Sounds good. So let's see how much we get 2000. You can confirm that figure for me times 2500. Uh, I'm getting 
$1,370 approximately. Then let's do for books, $450 over 3,650 times 2,500. Let's see what we got. And you can confirm the figure for me. So we stay on the same page. This is $308. Then the videos, how much was it? $1,200. Divided by 3650 times 2500. So 1,200, 3,650 times 2,500. And that gives me 822. When we add this up, it should give us 2,500. So 822 plus 308 plus 1,370 hmm, gives me 2,494, more or less like some approximation issues coming in there. Yeah, so approximation issues coming in there. It should be 2,500, but because of the approximation, that is how it is. So we're just gonna stay it for 2,500. So that is the allocation. I hope you're getting the idea. That is the allocation coming in here. Any questions, please put it in the chat for me. This is the step four. So step one, we identify the contract. Is there a contract between Mary and Inshira? Yes, there is a contract, checked. Two. What is the transaction? What is the uh, performance obligation? What is Insura doing under the contract? Okay, Insura will give Mary private tuition. Insura will give Mary books. Insura will give Mary lecture videos. That is the performance obligation. Okay, how much is Insura going to receive for all these things Insura is doing? That is the transaction price, $2,500. Okay, then how much is the $2,500 for each of the things Inshira is doing under the contract. That is a step four allocation. That is the step four allocation. I, I hope you're getting the idea well. Very, very critical. Very, very critical when we are, when we are dealing with this. I see some comments uh, coming in. Let's see if I can uh, look at them real quick. Uh, so maybe Unity said, so may so maybe you need to said, your way of teaching standards makes it easy for me to understand. And I really appreciate. Okay, that's great to hear. That's my objective always. And next, Obimpe said, hi, Inshira. Thanks for the good impact in our lives. Always a pleasure. Uh, Joshua Boachi Adam, okay, giving me the books figure, I guess, 308.22. Thank you uh, for the confirmation here there. So that is a step four. We allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation using their standalone prices, using their standalone prices. Then step five, step five, that is the primary thing we started with. We recognize revenue when or as a performance obligation is satisfied. We recognize revenue when or as performance obligation is satisfied. We recognize revenue when or as a performance obligation is satisfied. That is how we deal with these items generally when it comes to these things, when it comes to these things. Any questions? So this is the five step that we go in when it comes to dealing with the issue about IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. Now, remember, all these discussions we are doing so far is just premise on IAS 18, revenue, okay? We'll come to when performance obligation is more than a year, how we deal with that uh, pretty later on in the discussion of this particular standard. So we'll get into this much later on for the period under review. So let's look at this illustration here. And I want you to stay with me. It's just like the illustration I just I showed you a moment ago for Mary and Insura Premium, but I want to look at another question in that light. Then we'll pick a full question. Then you see how the pieces actually add together 
at the end of the day. Adolfo said, I'm not understanding step four. Okay, so what, what particular in step four you, you have problem with, you are having problem with. We are saying that step four, you allocate your transaction price, how much you are entitled to receive among the performance obligations, what you are going to be doing under the contract. So Adolphus, let me know where your challenge is basically under this one. So we are receiving 2,500. What are we doing? We are doing three things under the contract. Okay, so we now share that 2,500. Among the three things we are using, we are doing using the standalone prices of those three items. Adolfo, let me know where, where your actual question is and what I can actually do for you in that case. So let's pick the full question and then let's look at what we can do possibly as we look at that question. Adolfo's concern could be uh, dealt with. So look at this illustration we have here and how it actually adds up generally in dealing with this one. So a mobile phone company, Delta Wave Co gives customers a free handset when they sign up for a two year contract. When they sign up for a two year contract for the provision of network services. I want you to stay with me carefully. I'm going to do both IAS 18 and IFRS 15 with this illustration. So I want you to stay with me carefully to understand this. So V said, uh, will the standalone prices for the performance obligation be given to you in the question? Yes, it's always given to you so that you can find it out. It's always given to you so you can find it out. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. I look now, the handset has a standalone price of $100 and the contract is $20 per month. And the contract is $20 per month. And the contract is $20 per month. Now, so I want you to understand exactly what is going on here. I want you to understand what is going on here. The standalone price of the handset has been given to us and then the contract is at $20 per month. So if you look at it, the first question we need to ask ourselves is step one, identification of contract with customer. Is there a contract with a customer? Yes. Why? Because they said uh, the, there is a two year contract. So yes, there's a contract with customer here. Then we go to step number two, which we said was identify performance obligation. So what is the performance obligation that Delta Wave will give? I want you to stay with me carefully. So you realize that under this contract, there are two things. You get a free handset. So Delta Wave, it's under obligation to give a free handset. Then also provide network services. So provision of network services here, provision of network services here for the period under review. So the question we ask ourselves is how do we go about this generally for the period under review, for the period under review. So you realize that that is the second thing. We have identified the performance obligation. 
Step three, the transaction price. How much will Delta Wave receive under this contract? We are told that uh, the contract is $20 per month. Okay, so it means the transaction price, all other things being equal is the two year contract. It's going to be an amount of how much? $20 times 24 Twenty dollars times twenty-four. That is for two years, and that's four hundred and eighty dollars. So that is how much we are going to be receiving under the contract: four hundred and eighty dollars. That is how much we are going to be receiving under the contract. That is step number three. Then step number four, we say we allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation using the standalone prices. So let's expand that a little bit. The handset costs an amount of $100. Then the two-year contract is actually the 480 that we just had. So in total, the value is 580. In total, the value is 580 generally. So now let me explain this real quick. If we were in IAS 18 revenue, what is going to happen is that the handset, the cost of the handset, okay, the cost of the handset, which is the $100, will be treated as marketing cost, or if you want marketing expenses, and debited to the PL. and debited to the profit or loss. So if we're in the old IAS 18, the cost of the handset will be seen as what? Marketing cost. I mean, it, it is something we are making people to come. Now, it makes sense from marketing school of thought, but it doesn't make sense from an accounting school of thought. That is why IFRS 15 come in. Then once the cost of the handset is recognized as a marketing cost, the revenue recognizable will simply be the uh, contract value that will be receiving. So revenue, it's recognized at uh, what, $20 per month. That's all. So if we're in IAS 18 school of thought, that is how we're gonna be dealing with it. That's how we're gonna be dealing with it. We're gonna be thinking in this manner. That's all, IAS 18. But in IFRS 15, that is where these whole issues are popping up, okay? That is where these whole issues are popping up generally. So now that we know our performance obligation and their standalone prices, we could allocate the 480 to the performance obligation and then we'll get our answer coming in for the period under review. Then we'll get our answer coming in for the period under review for that particular one. That's basically the issue about this. That's basically the issue about this. Any questions, please? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? So if we want to allocate this, it could go this way. Let me shift it here a little so I could play around. So if we want to allocate 
revenue, this is going to be um, 100 over 580 times the transaction price 480. This is going to be 480 over 580 times 480. And then you get our answer coming in. So uh, the first one is going to be 82. So 82 minus 480. That's going to be an amount of 389. Sorry, 398. And that gives you a total of 480. So in IF, IAS 18, we would have done this and go away. But in IFRS 15, we must allocate. That's what we are saying here. And the IFRS 15, we must allocate. We must allocate. Now, so what happens? Then the step five says, recognize revenue as performance obligation is what? Satisfied. Recognize revenue as performance obligation is satisfied. Recognize revenue as performance obligation is satisfied. So what does that mean? Let's go back to the question. The question said, a mobile phone company, Delta, Delta Wave Co., gives customers a free handset. So on the date of signing on contracts, we have to recognize revenue. So at this point, there are two things that we need to bear in mind. And please stay with me carefully on this one. There is what is called revenue at and then revenue over. Stay with me carefully. There is what is called revenue at and revenue over. Revenue at is simply the revenue recognized at the date of the transaction. Or contracts. Then the revenue over is the revenue we recognize over the period of the contract. Over the period of the contract. So stay with me. If we go back to this question, at the date of the contract, can we recognize any revenue? Yes, because at the date of the contract, Delta Wave Co. will give the handset to the customer. So at the date of the transaction, we're going to be recognizing a revenue of $82. Because that is at the date of the contract. Have we satisfied the performance obligation? Yes, we give the handset to the customer. Immediately, the customer signs the contract. Then over the period of two years, we will recognize the remaining amount, 398. It's recognized over two years. Which means each year, we're going to be dividing by two. So annual revenue recognizable, it's going to be 398 over two. And I think that should be one something something, one nine something. 398 divided by two, one and nine. Sounds good. And this one will be recognized over two years. This is what we mean by IFRS 15, recognition of revenue. So you go through the, remember, like I said, in IAS 18, we don't deal with any other thing than we treat the handset as marketing cost, period. And then we recognize revenue as and when the person is due to be paid. But in IFRS 15, we need to allocate, then we need to think about revenue at the date of the contract and revenue over the period of the contract. At the date of the contract and revenue over the period of the contract. Any questions, please? Any questions, please? Any questions, please? So that is the issue there. That's the issue there. Now let's extend this with quite another question just like the same idea. And then let's see how we're going to be dealing with this particular one. So let's look at how we deal with this particular question as well. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Put it in the chat. I'm going to be answering all of the questions for you. 
if you have any questions, put it in the chat. It appears my screen isn't sharing. Let's see if we can get back. For some reason, my screen, sh my screen sharing, I guess, is, yup. Okay, it's up now. Let's go. The screen wanted to mess me up a little, but let's go. So stay with me and let's see how we can answer this question under IFRS 15, okay? Let's see how we can answer this question with IFRS 15. The requirement here, it's pretty simple. So this is the requirement. It says, if Levertech sold a combined contract on July 20X7, demonstrate how the transaction will be presented in the financial statement for the year ended 31st December 20X7. Remember, like I tell you all the time, when you are dealing with financial reporting, corporate reporting, when dealing with accounting standards, it's pretty critical for you to identify the year ended and the period in question. So remember in this question, we are told they sold the thing on 1st July, 2007, but the year ended is 31st December, 2007. So which means uh, the post sales period is actually six months. I want you to put that at the back of your mind because probably it will, it will come in handy as we are dealing with the revenue item. So let's read through the question and find out what exactly we have in this question, what we have in this question. Okay, so Sylvia is saying, what is the journal entry? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna show you the journal entry in this particular question. So stay with me uh, on that one because revenue is credit, uh, we credit uh, revenue and then we'll debit cash. Okay, so the journal entry, it's simply, uh, this is gonna be debiting because we've not receiving receive any cash here, we'll debit contract assets or contract receivable with the $82 and then we'll credit revenue. That that's why we are crediting revenue with 82. Does that make sense? So that would be the general entry for the 82, for instance, for the 82, for instance. Then uh, the revenue is received on a monthly basis at the end of the day. And so as and, and this contract revenue will be divided by 12, because I want to show you something. So 82, no, divided by 24, rather. Divided by 24. So 82 divided by 24, it's around 3.4. So the idea here is that, and then we'll do the uh, 398 also divided by 24, and that's 16.6. So this is the idea. When monthly uh, subscription is received, so monthly uh, subscription, which is the $20, when the $20 is received, this is how we account for it. We debit our cash because we are receiving that $20, okay? when we receive it or when it is due, then it will do the receivables coming in. Then we will credit the contract receivables, which we debited from the initial recognition here, 3.4, okay? We'll do that with 2.4 rather. 2.4, then we'll credit revenue 
with the balancing figure. And the balancing figure here, it's going to be what? 16.6. Are you okay, Sylvia? You asked for the double entry uh, for or the journal entry. So this is the journal entry. So the initial revenue of 82 that we recognized, what are we going to do? We divide it by the 24 months. So we debit contract receivables, credit revenue, no problem. But that contract receivable, which will be on the face of the statement of financial position, will be over 24 months. So that every month when we receive the 20, we will be using a portion of that to write off the contract receivable at the end of the day. Okay, Sylvia said she's okay. You are welcome. Adolfo said, Okay, say so I understand step four from the second question. Okay, that's awesome. Abdullah Mazuk said, oh, I missed the class. Please, will it be available on YouTube? Yes, definitely. It will be available on YouTube so you can get access to it uh, after the class, after the live stream. Okay, so let's look at this question. And this question will also bring in the more of the understanding of the IFRS 15 as we get into it for the period under review. So Levertech is a computer company that primarily sells computer hardware. As well as selling computer hardware, it also supplies and install the software to its customers and provide technical support package over two years. So let's let's listen to what is going on here okay let's listen to what is going on here uh the company sells computers hardware right then they said they supply and install install the software and also provide what technical support services over two years listen carefully the business commonly sells the supply and installation and technical support in a combined goods and service contract. So stay with me carefully. Off the hook, you realize that there are two things here. They supply and install activity number one. Then they provide technical support activity number two. So there are two performance obligations here that we need to understand of the hook. But then the examiner said they normally sell this in a combined contract. In other words, two for one two for one. So stay with me, let's see how they go. The combined goods and service contract sells for 1,600, okay. So if we supply the software and install the software and provide a technical support for over two years, the, con the transaction price here is gonna be what? $1,600. But if sold separately, the supply and installation is 1,005, technical support is 2,005. Wow, wow. So how do we go about this? How do we go about this one? So look at how we go about it. Now, definitely we're gonna follow our steps and bring in the issues in. So step one, is there a contract with customer? Yup, there is a contract with a customer because they said yes, uh, goods sold or service sold, So combine goods and services sold on 1st July 20X7. So yes, the race, step one, contract with customer. Step two, uh, what are we doing under the contract? Performance obligation. Yes, we saw there are two performance obligations, supply and install, and then technical support. So supply and installation, and then two years technical support. Two years technical support. So. The race performance obligation. This is what we're going to be doing. Okay. Step three. How much are we receiving on under the contract? That is the transaction price. 
we are told that the transaction price in, in this contract is 1,600 because that is the combined fee we charge for the service. So there is a transaction price. Okay, so now that we know the transaction price, we need to find out step four, how to allocate. So how do we do the allocation? Uh, supply and installation is gonna be here. It has a standalone price of how much we got? 1,005 from the question. And then the sub technical support has a, an amount of $500. So in total, it's gonna to be $2,000, but we are actually receiving $1,600 from the deal. So then revenue in respect of each of these items will be as follows. So that's gonna be 1,005 over 2,000 times 1,006. Then we can bring the balancing figure here directly. 1,005 over 2,000 times 1,600. That's 1,200. So that this becomes 400. So that is step number three. Sorry, step number four, allocation. Allocation, sounds good. So you're following the picture. Now, step number five is where we say, we recognize revenue as performance obligation is what? Satisfied. We recognize revenue as performance obligation is satisfied. So in step five, this is where we said we will have revenue at and then revenue over. So which of these two will we recognize at? Which of these will we recognize over? Who can give a shot on that? Which of the revenue will be recognized at? Which of the revenue will be recognized over? Can someone give a shot on that? Let's see. What do you think? Anybody with an idea? of which one can be recognized at and which one can be recognized over. Any ideas? Who can give a shot? How much do we recognize at the date of the transaction? How much do we recognize over the transaction? Now, our transaction date is 1st July 20X7. And our year ended from the question is 31st December 20X7. So Sylvia is saying that technical support is future. Okay, so you're saying that technical support should be over. Yes, so technical support will be over two years. So that will be over two years. And then at the date of the transaction, we will recognize the supply and installation because we have supply and install. We will recognize it at the end of the day. So how much revenue do we recognize for the year ended 31st December uh, 20 X7? So at 31st December 20 X7, this is how much revenue we're gonna recognize. Okay, so um, Joshua said the 1002 will be recognized at, okay. So we've mentioned that, will be recognized at. Eric CB said, when the ownership is transferred, yes, certainly once the contract is signed, uh, it means we've supply and install, so at. So revenue, recognizable, stay with me carefully. We're gonna be bringing in the supply and installation. So revenue in relation to supply and installation, that whole amount is gonna be brought. 
The amount there is 1,200. So that will be brought, recognize revenue there. Then for the technical support, the technical support is 400, but that is over two years. But so far we've done how many? Six months, do you remember it here? Yeah. We've done six months so far. Sounds good. We've done six months so far on this one. Six months, six months. So since we've done six months, we're gonna spread that over six months. So it's going to be $400 over 24 times six. So 400 over 24 times six, that's gonna be 100. 100, okay? Hence, the total revenue recognizable is gonna be 1,300. Sounds good. So this is the revenue we recognize. This is the revenue we recognize. This is the revenue we recognize. Any questions, please? Any questions? Sylvia, you put that 1,400. How, how did you get 1,400? You didn't take into consideration that, right? Because the period is important. The contract, the technical support is about two. Uh, yes, but then we sell, we sold, we signed a contract on 1st July. So from 1st July to 31st December, we've done just six months, hence only that portion is gonna be recognized. Only that portion is gonna be recognized uh, for the period under review. Only that portion will be recognized. So this is the amount of revenue that we will recognize for this particular item under review for this particular item under review. So, oh, okay. So Messi said, sorry, I calculated for one year instead of two years. Okay, I get it. So assuming that the clients paid all the 1,600, then that means that 300 of that must be recognized as a liability, okay? So there will be deferred income as a liability of $300, assuming the customer paid all. Now that deferred income as a liability is 18 months. So it must be splitted into current liability and then non-current liability. That's a current liability and non-current liability. So what is gonna happen is that the current liability is gonna be the next 12 months uh, payments receivable. So the next one year receivable is gonna be $200. So that the $100 will be the other six months coming in. So this is the answer generally to the question. if we are dealing with this particular item here. Any questions, please? And so this is the five-step framework we follow. Now, this is just the IAS 18 aspect of IFRS 15. There is a second leg, which is the construction contract part, where the performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year and how it is supposed to be treated, it is supposed to be accounted for by an organization. Any questions, please? Any questions? This is how we deal with revenue from contract with customers. This is how we deal with revenue from contract with customers. Any questions, please? So this is the general idea about the revenue recognition. The backdrop basically on what we are saying here is that revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is what? Satisfied. And we said that a performance obligation is satisfied when there is transfer of control. 
And so we follow the five-step framework. We identify the contract. Is there a contract? Yes, there is. Okay, what are we doing under this contract? The performance obligation. Okay, how much are we receiving under the contract? The transaction price. Okay, how much is the value of the transaction price to all the various things we are doing under the contract? Allocation. Then once we allocate, we recognize revenue in the PL account as or when a performance obligation is satisfied. Any amount received prior to the performance of an obligation is recognized as a deferred income. That is a liability on the face of the statement of financial position. Any amount received in prior to the performance obligation or satisfying the performance obligation is recognized as a deferred income. That is a liability on the face of the statement of financial position. So when it comes to IAS 18 replacement in the school of thought of IFRS 15, these are the things that you must understand when it comes to this one for the period under review. Any questions for me, please? Any questions for me, please? I'm going to conclude around here today. And God willing, on Friday, we'll look at the second leg, that is the part two, where performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. How do we deal with that? When performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year, how do we deal with that? So on Friday at 4.30 p.m., join me on the live stream as we look at the part two of this. Then we'll now take a full question and see how all these actually play out when it comes to dealing with IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. Uh, Joseph Mumbi said, great. Um, Adolfos, Adolfo said, great for today. Okay. Joseph said, some more. Okay. We're going to be continuing with a discussion on Friday, uh, God willing. Remember, if there are any details you have, you can visit our website at insurapremium.com. You can also download our mobile application on uh, the Apple Store or the iOS. So if, whether you're on Android or iPhone, you just search for Insura Premium and you can download our mobile application. There are free lecture videos exclusive that is not available here on YouTube in the application that you can watch. You get access to also some blog uh, post some key notes that will help you as well. Then you can also enroll in our uh, courses online so you can study under my mentorship. And all these are going in if you're enrolling in the courses 390 Ghana Cities. If there are any questions, you know how to reach us out. Follow me on Instagram and I'll catch you on Friday as we continue with our discussion. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Somevi Unity said, God bless you abundantly. Amen. Unity, God bless you too. Sylvia Mercy said, need details about your course. Okay, Sylvia, you can visit insurapremium.com. You can check the description of this video and go there. Or you can WhatsApp us 050-114-9296. 9296. You can uh, send us high on WhatsApp and you will get details to our courses here. So this is the number to reach us on WhatsApp. Or you can go to Instagram, send me a message, try to send me a DM on Instagram. You will get an automatic uh, link to be able to get access to whatever you want. Or you can send high on WhatsApp on this particular number here. Emma Adi said, thank you. It's really great. Wow, that's awesome to hear, Emma. Thanks very much for joining us. So thanks to everybody for joining as uh, Timothy, Adolfos, Messi, Wandu, uh, Anesu, Elijah, Vincent, Philip, Seth Ose, Nyakon, uh, Sylvia, Unity, Boache, everybody else, thanks very much. And uh, for joining us on the live stream. I'll catch you same time on Friday as we continue with our discussion. Like I keep on saying, the exams is going to be coming very soon, very soon. So don't relax. Don't say, oh, I'm relaxing some more. I'm tired. No, be learning, be learning, be learning until you become a chartered accountant. Thank you. And I'll catch you on Friday at 4.30 p.m. as we continue with our discussion. Stay safe and take care of yourself. Bye-bye.